We are pleased to welcome George LaRock, uh, one of the premier enforcers of the NHL. And George, you've been through a terrible ordeal over the last week, having suffered from the coronavirus. But we understand that you just got home Monday afternoon. But even that in itself was a little bit of an ordeal. Can you just sort of take us back, first of all, to how you managed to get from the hospital when you were discharged today to home right now? It actually it was very complicated because uh, nobody wanted to come and get me. <laughs> when usually you could get a ride. I was discharged at one and I only got home now because, and I understand people are a bit scared with what's going on and, and the cabs, they can't come. So uh, I was fortunate to find a friend, uh, somebody that, that, that came last minute to get me in. And, and I was obviously full of protection, sitting in the back of his car, not touching anything, pretty much being a bulk like this. Because I want to make sure that uh, nothing was going to happen, but uh, you know, in on these times, I understand. Um, you know, all people are reacting uh, towards it. It's normal, and now I'm at home in confinement. I have to stay inside, which I will, which is okay. And and I'm just so happy just to be at home, taking my medication instead of being in the hospital. The hospital was hard seen because I was in a room with with two other patients that were affected by it. They were elderly uh, people, and they were really affected. And they, you know, they, they needed a lot of help. And, and I saw that every day in front of me. So me, uh, I, you know, I know that I'll be able to fight it through. I'm young and I'm healthy. But still, the first two days, it was hard because my asthma was really bad. And my breathing was hard and I needed lots of oxygen. And I was really struggling. But, uh, you know, just the fact that yesterday, since yesterday, they need extra oxygen to, uh, to breathe. Uh, it was really, uh, really encouraging because, uh, um, you know, gasping air, um, gasping for air is one of the worst feeling when, uh, when, uh, you, when you can't breathe. That's just a terrifying experience that you're recounting to us, George. Uh, how did this, this actually start? Because I, I read that, that these symptoms started to crop up early last week, and then you got admitted to the hospital Thursday, last Thursday, April 30th. So what were those ensuing days like and what symptoms were you feeling? Actually, on Sunday, um, I, I was having a fever. And, and not, not a fever, but a cold sweat. And when I slept, I wet my bed and I was shaking and I really didn't feel good and I started coughing. So the next day, I was supposed to go to a CHSLD helping elderly people. And I called the center on Sunday night and the girl in, in charge because I was going to be an employee. I filled up paperwork to help out. And I said, I'm sick. I don't think I could come tomorrow. So she's like, are you sure? It's like, I'm so sorry. So the next day I go to the hospital because I'm like, why am I sick? I never get sick. So I go there to, to see if I could get diagnosed to see what's wrong with me. The doctor doesn't want to give, do me a test. He, he checks my x-ray because I have a hard time breathing. And he said, your lungs are a bit swelled up. So he gives me a prescription for, for cortisone. So I go back home and things get worse. I don't get any better. And I'm like, what's going on? And then the hospital calls me back. They said, George, there's a mistake on the x-ray. We see pneumonia. And I was like, what? So I call back the doctor that tells me that I have pneumonia. And the doctor says, uh, the, 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 the secretary of the doctor said, He's, she's not there anymore. You have to wait till the next day, which now it brings us back to Thursday. So Thursday, my situation is really, really bad now, my breathing and everything. So I go to the hospital and then uh, I'm like, you know what? I don't understand. I, I wanted to do a test. You guys didn't want to. Can I get a test done so I could tell the people if I'm infected that they could be also? They're like, uh, and they were surprised that the first doctor didn't do it. They're like, we're supposed to be protecting the test. We don't have enough, but okay, we'll do it. They do a test. I have it. And with my breathing, they connect me to oxygen. And because where I was, they can't keep patients that need oxygen. They sent me to Shalom One in the hospital in the floor that where everybody's connected to oxygen and we're all infected, a red zone. So I'm in a room with three people, all infected, sitting there, not knowing what's going to happen, and uh, just plugged to oxygen and uh, waiting for my lungs to be better. And uh, yeah, so I knew my life was not in danger, but still, it's still a scary thing when, when, when you have asthma and you in a room with people that are infected and you just wait things to get better and you just hope to be discharged at home to be able to take uh, to take your medication home 
I guess one of the, the one of the most important, or sorry, the most unfortunate aspects of your story is that uh, you believe that you might have contracted the virus while you were helping people, while you were out in the community doing good. Can you just tell us uh, uh, what what actually happened in the days leading up to the virus showing symptoms? that led you to, um, I guess, have to take this path yeah. to actually do contact tracing? Well, actually, because elderly people couldn't do, well, they didn't want to get out of the house to do groceries, so I volunteered for them and I did it for them uh, because, you know, it, it was it was advice to them to stay at home. So I just took their list of groceries and went to different a couple different grocery stores to pick up stuff for them. And uh, when I did that, you know, uh, you know, people say how contagious this thing is. You could be picking up a couple products that you face after, and that's it. So, of course, when you go to grocery store, you wash your hand, and then when you go in your car, you use Perel. But all it takes, as people say, is to pick up something, and while you're walking, you touch your face, you do something, you forget or whatever, and then that's it. And I did so many groceries, deliveries for people that, at the, in that span, that I know that's how it happened because I didn't do anything else. I didn't do party. I didn't hang out. I didn't. I didn't do anything. There was no radio, nothing. Everything that I was doing was closed. But the only thing that was not closed is the groceries so I could help others. And that's how I got it. So it just shows you that you could pretty much get it anywhere. And you just have to be really careful. When I got sick, um, first first person right away that calls me Glenn Sater, my GM that drafted me when I was junior. Glenn Sater, Kevin Lowe, Craig McTavish, Wayne Gretzky, Janet Gretzky, um, uh, Craig Simpson, uh, Kevin Lowe, like Grand Fjord, like Bill Renford, Gerald McGinley, uh, Crosby, uh, like all the players, pretty much everybody it was insane, and uh, it, it was so appreciative to 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 get everybody calling, see how you doing. Mike Greer, like every every single player, pretty much. Well, George, I think that's uh, a lot of people outside the hockey world too, because you are a very public uh, figure in the Montreal community, in and around Quebec, and uh, just people at society at large uh, wish you the best too in a, a a speedy and full recovery. And we thank you for your generosity of this time. Hope you get well as soon as possible, and uh, don't find the two weeks of confinement too terribly difficult. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks for having hey. me. Thank you, George. Much appreciated.